listeners, welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Our guest is a Thurber Prize winning humorist, John Kenny, author of novels such as Truth in Advertising and the comedic poetry collections Love Poems for Married People and Love Poems for Anxious People. Today, John brings us a lighter side of being trapped inside the house during a worldwide pandemic. Here's John Kenny in conversation with his editor, Sally Kim. Hi, I'm Sally Kim, um, editor in chief at Putnam, and I am here with John Kenny, who is the author of many, many books, but most recently, Love Poems for Married People. Love Poems for People with Children, and the upcoming Love Poems for Anxious People. But John, I remember a day or two into this quarantine, this remote working situation, I remember a very specific email that you sent me. We were catching up and you said, you know, this time at home with everyone is is quite nice, actually. It's surprisingly relaxing. And I remember like almost spinning up my coffee when I got that email and I thought, wow, I'm feeling the complete exact opposite, but how do you feel now? Are you just as relaxed as those first few days? <laughs> Sally, that is a very unfair question. Um, <laughs> first of all, thank you for having me on the podcast. It's great to be here. And uh, I would say my feelings are a little different. <laughs> 400 days into this uh, thing, it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge. You know, maybe there is such a thing as too much time with family. I don't know. Let's let's unpack that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We we I don't know what day it is. There is no day. Yeah. No. It's the longest. This is the longest Monday of your nightmares. Um, We we were both. I remember the early days cautioning each other in at the end of all of our emails, like. P.S. Don't run out of wine. Don't run out of coffee. That's been our sort of <laughs> our, our our high points for us. But um, but really, yeah, I'm willing to go. I'll go to a store maskless for the wine <laughs> and the coffee. I will. No gloves. I'll roll around on the floor to get the wine and the coffee. <laughs> so a few days or maybe about a week into this, um, you and your family kind of um, escaped New York City and went to Cape Cod. How's that been so far? Yeah, you know, it's. It, I will be honest and say there's there there was a little bit of guilt because we we were fortunate enough to you know uh, we we come up. I'm from the Boston area. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I have no idea why I said Boston area. I'm from Boston, <laughs> um, but we go to Cape Cod every summer, and we rent a little house. And uh, I reached out to the man who owns it, and he's like, "Sure, go ahead," and. Uh, So, you know, there was that sort of thing about being a longtime New Yorker. I mean, I've lived in the city for 25 years that, you know, you don't leave New York in a crisis, but it was getting it was getting scary, you know, and I have a son, a seven year old who has asthma. And I just, you know, the the brain starts running and, and hospitals were getting real full. And so, you know, my wife and I said, you know, should we do this? And, uh, you know, we, we packed up the car and we've been up here and, you know, we feel very fortunate. Um, and, it, you know, not everyone gets to do that. And, and so I, I do feel very lucky that, that we've been able to, to come up. It's a, it's a tiny little old house. And, and uh, uh, I don't let uh, my wife or the, the children stay with me. Um, I, don't, I don't know where they are. I've not, I've <laughs> you haven't seen, seen them, them in weeks. <laughs> Yeah, no, but that's, I, I, I assume they're fine. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wish them the best. I hope you they're just, safe. I hope Sally. they just, e- you know, email, just email's good. Text. Keep in, keep in yeah. touch is what I said as yeah. I pulled away from the rest stop. <laughs> uh, so it's, you know, what it's, it's, uh, you know, what's going on in New York is, 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 is insane. Uh, and, yeah. you know, my heart's there and I, 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 we feel lucky to be here. And, uh, but, um, I think that's part of the thing. You know, we were, we were talking about this before we sort of hit the record button that it, it's it's hard to, it's always hard to predict the future. Yeah. But you can do that. You can put things on a schedule. You can plan dinner. You can schedule a book reading. You, mm-hmm. you know, everything is up in the air now. And it's, uh, it's, not, it's not anxiety producing at all for me. No. 
No, it's the, yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, it's funny. You and I both have children around the same age, and um, we've been sharing notes about <laughs> the delightful and surprising things that we've noticed. But um, some observations from quarantine that I wanted to see if you agree um, that I've just kind of jotted down uh, for myself. Um, birds are very loud. They're very loud. I think mean, that's one thing that I, I don't think I ever focused on before because I'm never home during the day and the birds around me. Yeah. Are they loud up in Cape Cod? <laughs> so not only are birds loud, okay, and maybe too loud, but there's more birds on Cape Cod. <laughs> and I don't know if there's an invention or I don't it, I don't know what's going on, but at about 20 of six every morning, the birds start yeah. every morning. And the first couple of mornings, it was like, oh, my gosh, birds. birds. This is so beautiful. <laughs> and and now I, you know, I stand in my underwear at the window shouting at the <laughs> birds, you know, shut, shut the hell up. <laughs> I don't think it's. You know, some of the neighbors have not loved that. But no, they, but they know birds, you're from New York. Birds are loud. Um, and uh, it's weird because it's very raw nature up here, right? It's it's Cape Cod in the sort of off season. Feels like, you know, the coast of Ireland or England. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's windy and cold. And, um, you know, we were... We were <laughs> You know, when we play baseball, like my son and daughter and stuff, we go to the local sort of turf lot where there's a, you know, a guy with a boombox smoking a doobie. Yeah. And my, my, my son, the first couple of days was like, Dad, what's that smell? And I said, I don't know. What is it? He goes, oh, I think, I think it's fresh air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've never smelled and, this and before. <laughs> but the third day, he said, Dad, can we get a backyard? Because <laughs> uh, these I are told pretty him cool. No, and, I punished him. Yeah. And I was going to say, my other observation is, um, especially with kids, is, you know, because I'm used to cooking dinner maybe four times a week, you know, at most. Um, the, and now being a short order chef, like uh, uh, cooking three meals a day, the time between meals is astonishingly short. It's like I find yeah. myself saying, like, it's time to feed you again. You guys are eating, you know, the refrigerator clean. Um, and it's an unfortunate time for my son to be going through a growth spurt right now. The other night he, he had third. He was eating like, a, like, a, like oh. a college football player. Oh, he had three servings of dinner the other night. And I was like quietly sort of panicking, um, knowing what was sort of in the cupboard. Um, his two favorite sayings lately have been, I'm still hungry. <laughs> and he asks yeah. me like between the hours of four and six about a million times, what's for dinner? what are you making for dinner? What's for dinner? And, you know, I'm usually on a conference call or something. And so the meal, the focus on eating and meals has been such a surprise. Yeah. So how do you guys handle all that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like going back in time a little bit. It's like a little bit of a, like a little house in the prairie thing. Yeah. Cause everything's just around, well, I just, you know, we got a baked bread and, and <laughs> somehow procure milk and, and, you know, that's the big thing. You know, we, we, Lisa makes my wife and she, makes the meals and I clean up and it's just it's it's just a it's the kids essentially live in like a four seasons now it's just oh, like yeah. uh could you bring it to my room and it's like this is a tiny little old house it's like no I'm not bringing it to your room <laughs> come down and get it they don't and I bring it to their room and then you know I clean up their room. I don't know, it's just it's other, it is a constant food thing isn't it yeah the other day I said okay it's time for bath and they're like they looked at me like, do we have to really take, I mean, we didn't go outside today. You know, it's like this sort yeah. of certain new logic now. It's like, and part of me is like, you know what? You didn't. <laughs> Let's skip it. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I'm, a, I'm in exactly the same boat. And, you know, my, the sort of screen time rules have, you know, it's like alternate side parking in New York have been <laughs> suspended. It's yeah. just like, how, how long have you been on the screen? Six hours. All right, two more hours. And that's <laughs> it, mister. <laughs> That's it. Not uh, doing longer than eight today. No. So how's how's the speaking of um how's the teaching career going? <laughs> Our newfound oh. 
newfound hobbies. It's 1820 in this household. It's yeah. about the making of food and the, you know, sitting down and doing math and teaching them. It's, it's, it's we should get them those little mini chalkboards, you know, like little house. Yep. <laughs> yeah. No, that it's we've got an abacus. So <laughs> it's, uh, uh, and I, is it, is it me or do they have more work now that it's online? Yeah. Well, partly because like, you're spending the time trying to figure out the technology of, I'm always like, where, where did they list that, that assignment again? And my daughter's like reaching over trying to show me, I'm like, no, 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 let me do it. Um, I think half the time is trying to find out, figure out where the attendance form is and where all the assignments yeah. are. And, um, yeah. And I always thought that I was a pretty good, like an attentive parent. I mean, I think, I, I, I fancied myself quite a quite a good parent. I think what this has revealed is what a total dog shit parent I am because like helping them with their home, I'm like, I have no idea what you have to do. I, yeah. I don't, I, 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 dad, can you help me write a story? No, I've got my <laughs> own stories to write. No, I'm not helping you. You're seven, figure it <laughs> out. Dad, I have to write a poem. I don't know anything about writing poems. Just go, go do it yourself. Um, but it's, um, the, you know, thank God for the online school thing. Otherwise, what, you know, I'd oh, send no. them out to work or something. I know. Uh, I wanted to see uh, the other day, there was a piece in the times about, um, and I actually <laughs> meant to send this to you. Um, I'll send it to you after this call, but, uh, the, about the Finnish tradition of pants drunk. It's an actual word. <laughs> And I thought, no one else will get this more than John Kenny. <laughs> Pants drunk, I think, describes my four-year college experience. <laughs> well, that's going to come in handy now. I think that said yeah. that on my actual diploma. So, no, what is pants drunk? So it's basically... I love the name. It's the term of kind of just, you know, being at home, relaxing with a glass of wine or a beer and not wearing pants. Because <laughs> you really can't fully relax if, you know, without with with pants on, I mean, it's just it's Boy, impossible. I, I, you know, I guess there's a little finish in all of us. <laughs> I, I, I love that idea. Um, my son must be partially Finnish because um, his idea of relaxing, e even at seven, uh, is to walk into the house to remove all of his clothing mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know sit down on some surface and just you know pick up an iPad. Yeah, and that was before hey, hey, uh, coronavirus. You, yeah. Oh, and now, I mean, hey, bud, do you want to go for a walk? No, thanks. I'm good. Yeah. Just in his bed. Hey, do you have any clothes on? Uh, no, dad, I'm good. I'm fine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can't blame him. Just putting in my eight hours of screen time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, he's on the clock. Pants drunk. Wow. Pants like drunk, that. yeah. Yeah. It's a real thing. So, John, everybody knows you, Every millions across the globe know you as oh, the author of Love Poems for Married People. Um, not many people know about the origins of, of how that collection came to be. Yeah, well, um, uh, the National Poetry Foundation uh, came to me. Uh, Mary Oliver uh, reached out <laughs> to me um, and said, you strike me as a poet. That's a lie. <laughs> Um, I don't mean to laugh. <laughs> Thank you, my editor laughing at me. Um, I have been writing for The New Yorker for a while, and I wrote a piece, what was it, 2016 maybe, called Valentine's Day Poems for Married People. And people seemed to like that. And you and I were at a cocktail party at Penguin, and I didn't know who I was talking to. I didn't realize like how important she was. And she was like, we should make a book out of that. And I was like, yeah, right. you know what? I think I was pants drunk at that party. Yeah, you were. I think I, I'm pretty sure I was pants drunk at that party. And I was like, yeah, right. And I think I like pushed her or something and like, but missed and slipped and or spilled something on her. And then you said, oh, that was, I forget her name. Uh, that was Someone. probably the sales director of the Penguin Publish yeah, it was really like different. Michelle Obama or yeah. something like that. And it was the Michelle Obama of publishing. And then you said the next day or the next week, I don't know, uh, how would you feel about writing a book? 
and I thought you were joking as well. Um, but you and I did that over the next couple of months. And I should say here, I am a happily married man. I, I, um, I dedicated the book to my wife, the first one. And, uh, she, uh, we've been married for 15 years. She edited along with you, um, those poems. She saw all of them. And, uh, hi, Harry. <laughs> Come here. Get over here, Harry. For those of you listening, Sally and I can see each other. Yeah. I think Harry has come up. What is he looking for? Brownies no, or something? No, no. I, I what does he want? Up. A side of beef? <laughs> I Harry, bragged long wait ago. I, <laughs> I let them go watch a movie upstairs. I was, no, I was motioning to my husband and shh. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. We're on a podcast I don't believe now. you have a husband. I've known <laughs> you for how many years have I known you? I've never seen your husband. I've never yeah. spoken to your husband. It's all I fake. think it's a. I think it's a ruse. It was my ruse to get you to write this book. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we, we wrote that, right? And, and uh, the next thing you know, um, I, you know, uh, what did I, I mean, I, I made, I, I think royalties on that were $25 million. Because yeah. um, everybody, me. as you've always said, gets into poetry for the money. <laughs> if you want to make the big money, you're a moron if you go into like a hedge fund thing. It's <laughs> Poetry is where it's at. <laughs> so then there was uh, the natural progression to love poems for people with children. Yes. And we have the third volume, Love Poems for Anxious People, coming out on April 21st, which is like a couple weeks from now, which means it's going to feel like two years from now, but it's coming out April 21st, um, which is both excellent and not so excellent timing, given the, the way the world is. <laughs> But let me tell you, it couldn't be more relevant right now. Um, people don't know that the cover of this upcoming book is actually the Pantone color of the year, which is called Anti-Anxiety Blue. Did you know is that? Is that true? I did not know uh, that. The things I, I didn't tell you. Wow. Wow. Uh, I did, yeah, I did very not know timely. That. Also, I think, uh, because you're a very modest and hugely accomplished person, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you designed the cover. No, I suggested the scribble. You know, I'm good for that's, a good that's scribble. Like so. That's what the cover is, is the, <laughs> is the scribble, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, you know, uh, the love poems for married people and love poems for people with children were sort of, you know, first cousins. But you and I talked a fair amount about what should the next one be? Um, should it be in-laws? Should it be, you know, love poems for divorced people? Mm -hmm. Might Maybe a little too negative. I but think we, we were both, even thinking people love poems for people who are considering divorce, I think was one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> title Which, for a while. I thought were funny, but we were pants drawn. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and everything's funnier. Um, and so we settled on love poems for anxious people because, you know, we asked a bunch of people and they were like, oh my God, that like, I'm so anxious. And I think, you know, to, uh, to steal from Auden, um, you know, this is the age of anxiety. And it's uh, funny, I remember when we were talking about it, we thought specifically about the upcoming election. We had no idea what the spring was going to bring. Um, so it's, no. it's, yeah, that's what I mean. It's like, it's uncanny kind of in the timing. Um, but it's funny, all, all your worlds, kind of marriage, children, anxiety are kind of beautifully colliding in a I don't know what the metaphor would be uh, during this time of quarantine. There's been a lot of chatter because you've been posting some videos on social media, <laughs> which I have really have. hit a nerve. So tell us about like what what kind of spawned those. It was actually the kids' idea. They were like, "Dad, we should post a video to Instagram." And I said, "Well, what should it be about?" And well, let's just let's just do one. Make up a poem. I mean, this whole thing is everyone. Why are people so obsessed with toilet paper? And I was like, okay, let's <laughs> write a thing special. about toilet paper. And we got really lucky, and my wife taped us, and we did. We got it on the first take, and what we realized is we had a little gold, because Hewitt and Lulu are looking at me like, you embarrass me yeah. so much. <laughs> and uh, we were off to the races. And then Lulu suggested one, uh, she said, you know, your hair looks terrible. Can we, can I cut your hair tonight? And I was like, well, what if we film it? And so we got some clippers and they were supposed to just 
take a little bit off, but Hewitt just, you should, uh, you can't I, see it. I mean, you can see it, but your listeners can't. There's just yeah. a divot oh, of yeah. different points. It's, it's not good. I don't look good at well, I all. Love, I love the end of that video. So you're reading a poem and at the, the, the video's kind of panning out and you see that your two children going at it, <laughs> at your hair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's just like the hair just falling all over the place. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, thank God for a little social distancing right now because uh, I don't look good. So I think I think the next video should have you just completely bald, just just shave it all off. I've, let's I let's just say I've got a face for a podcast. <laughs> let's just just say that. So is it hard right now in? The world we live in and kind of dealing with everything that we're dealing with, you know, being professional cooks and teachers, um, to decide what's funny? Like, how's the writing go? I mean, is it hard to kind of say, this is going to be funny to me, to somebody else? You know, it's interesting because for me, I mean, I can only speak for me, but writing funny is always incredibly hard, right? It's, you know, 98% of what I come up with is terrible and uh, then, you know, you, you, you get lucky sometimes, but I, I, I'm of the mind that says the worst things get the more potential because, you know, I, I guess funny for me is the thing you least expect. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's pushing something to the point where you know, I mean, my wife and I looked at each other the other night. We, we had just, you know, made the mistake of listening to NPR and the apocalyptic numbers. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not at home. And, you know, I make my living besides, you know, writing books. I'll, I'll, I, I do some freelance writing on the side. That's completely dried up. We're wondering if we should move from New York. And my son walks into the kitchen with an empty bag of goldfish, naked. <laughs> Dead serious. We're completely out of goldfish. <laughs> we we look at each other. My wife and I start laughing hysterically. Yeah. Because it's so ridiculous. <laughs> and for for me, that's an interesting place to be. Right. I can't emphasize enough what's going on is so unspeakable and painful, but. It is amazing to see people rise to the occasion and and make jokes. And to me, there's hope in that. There's tremendous hope in the resiliency of laughing in the face of pain, whether that's what's going on now, whether that's marriage, whether that's marriage with children, whether that's feeling anxious about the future, about being cooped up. Um, that matters to me because it, it, it gets me through the day a little bit and, and it helps. And you know, the other things about, about anxiety, I, I, you know, you and I talked a lot about this and, and, you know, if there's anyone listening who does suffer from anxiety and I think all of us do to some extent, it's mm -hmm. a, it's a, it's a natural part of our makeup. Um, but you know, we, we talked extensively about not ever sort of, um, you know, making fun of it or, or, you know, there, there, there are serious issues out there with anxiety. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I, my wife is a therapist. She talks to people on the phone who are really worried about what's going on, understandably so. But I think you and I really were keen on finding that sort of everyday silliness that we all feel the conversation we had where we said something asinine and we're like, Oh my God. And you're playing the conversation back or the dating faux pas or the, the the you know the thing the wrong thing you said to your father-in-law i think well, i said something once to my father-in-law about how attractive my wife's ass was and that as it was coming out it's like not going too far <laughs> no that's her dad well i remember i mean you just recently what was it a month ago it feels like a million years ago but uh you published the new yorker did um published your your quarantine, a poem about sort of washing your hands, the, uh, yeah. you know, being afraid of, of COVID. And um, I remember when we were talking about it, you were like, I don't know, is it too soon? Is it, but I think 
um, I got a lot of emails about it. And I think one of the things about that piece was that everybody was thinking everything that was coursing through those, the lines of that poem. But what you did with it is that you amplified it to such a level that you just, you know, you saw yourself, but you also had to laugh because it was just so taken to the nth degree, so laughable. Um, and, you know, taking a, a thing that was really happening to a lot of people, but applying that John Kenny lens on it, I, I I thought I know it brought a lot of people laughter. I mean, a lot of people who emailed me said this is the first time I laughed this week was reading John's poem. Oh well, that's yeah. that that's really nice to hear. I, I mean, I find comfort because uh, you know maybe it's my own adult brain, but I think so often in normal times forget what we're living through now. Um, it's very easy to feel alone with your thoughts and, and forget, I think, that there's such a universality in the fear, the anxiety, the confusion, the anger, the sort of, I think I'll just crawl under my bed today and spend it there sucking my thumb, mm -hmm. which I did yesterday. Um, Pants that, <laughs> If we can find community in that, if we can find a little humor, um, man, I don't know. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Andy Borowitz. He's just, I just think he's a great guy and a hilarious guy. You know, some of his headlines in the Borowitz report, it's just, you know, not to overshare, but I've just had the worst day. Like I, I've had today, I just had the worst. Yeah. It, 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 mm. it just, it all. I'm reading too much news and the weather is really terrible here. And it's just, I, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring and, and am I ever going to work again? And, and the, the cavalcade of stuff that so many of us uh, have to deal with, but, but, you know, I'll read Andy's thing or I'll come across something or my, my son will walk in with the empty goldfish thing <laughs> naked. The day's a little better. Yeah. Right. I found that prior to this, the last thing I wanted to do was get on the phone mm -hmm. with anyone ever. Especially your editor, text. right? <laughs> oh, God. It was a text message or it was an email, right? Yeah. And now I'm craving a talk on the phone or a Zoom chat or, you know, uh, I think we need that connection, not just um, physical I think we need the intimacy of friendship and ridiculousness. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's a long day. I feel very bad for people living. I both envy and feel very bad for people living alone. Uh, what's an, okay, let's, an, ad, let's admit one thing. What's an embarrassing yeah. low point that you've had? I'll, I'll go first. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about, something okay. really mundane. We, it was like before a market run, so we were low on everything. And one morning I'm like to the kids, you know, what do you guys want for breakfast? And Olive says, you know what? I'm going to have some Cheerios and milk. And I had the carton of milk in my hand. And I thought, if I give her the milk for the Cheerios, I'm not going to have enough for my coffee. I, I actually paused. Yeah. I mean, that, that's my dirty little secret is that I actually paused before giving my nine-year-old child milk for her cereal because I wanted to save it for my coffee. And I thought, what am I doing? Oh, I'm going to shake see, myself away. I thought, <laughs> I thought you were going to go one step further and say, you suggested pancakes. <laughs> and then you got to keep the milk. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, one. I have to remember that one. Um, my, I guess my embarrassing things are sort of my worst neuroses come out about this thing. Like, you know, we've had a couple of packages uh, you know, yeah. m mailed here and the kids will run out, you know, like it's Christmas because there's literally nothing to do here mm -hmm. uh, and go to touch the package. And I'll, I will scream at them like it's plutonium. Yeah. Don't <laughs> touch it. It could go off. <laughs> Even though, like children are largely immune from this thing. Yeah. It seems, thank God, I think. And I break out the wipes and, don't touch anything in it. I think it's just made all of my sort of just under the surface neuroses, you know, through the roof. Yeah. 
we, we're on this street where, I mean, very few people live. And so we'll go for a walk. And the other day, you know, we, there was an old, older woman walking down the street and I was like, okay, well, th- this is ruined. Yeah. We have to turn around and go back. We can't, you know, even though she was 50 yards away. Yeah. Thanks for ruining that old woman. <laughs> okay. So yeah. we have to end on a high note though. Okay. So okay. what is, what is one, what is the best thing you've discovered? while being stuck, <laughs> stuck <laughs> with your family 24 seven. God, I don't mean to sound sappy, but how well we all get along. Yeah. And how much fun they are to be around. Um, it's, uh, you know, my wife's working from home. We're in this place. It's about, I think this place is about 1400 square feet, which, you know, compared to our apartment, apartment in Brooklyn is palatial, but every meal together, family yeah. movie nights, two or three, you know, nights a week, uh, helping them with their homework. I grew up in a somewhat <clears throat> fractured family. And I think what has surprised and, and thrilled me is that little nuclear unit of the four of us, or however you're defining family. I mean, it could be a Zoom call with your best friends, and that's your family. But it, it's it's really put solid ground under my feet and, and, and m- m- made this very difficult thing that reminds us of the fleeting nature of life really uh, profoundly beautiful to me. And I know that's not a funny answer, but it's, 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 it's surprised me how, uh, how real and important that's been. How about you? What's what's what? How about what? What has it been for you? I think it's the same. It's it's been surprising that um, I mean, one of the things if normal in in sort of normal day to day life, I always have my phone, my cell phone next to me, no matter if I'm at a restaurant or because in case I always say in case the school calls, in case something happens. Um, and soon into this, you know, being stuck together, quarantined, I realized everyone I care about is within these four walls. Like, I don't have to be panicked all the time about what's happening out there in the world. I have my eyes on them all the time. And there's such comfort in that. It reminds me of, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I'd go on a, like a road trip with my my two sisters and my parents. And I remember having that thought, even as a kid, everybody I love and care about is in this car. And there's something very, you know, beautiful way to put it. Yeah. So it's been nice, you know, waking up every morning thinking, you know, going to go wake them up now and, you know, hoard the milk away from them. (laughs) But they're my kids and they're here and my husband's here and we're all, we're all where we should be. And yeah, that's a really lovely way to put it. Well, thanks so much for spending this time. We should do this more often, actually. I would love yeah. that. That was it's it's nice to see your lovely face and and uh, uh, let's. Uh, I'd love to. I don't believe he exists, but I'd love to meet your husband. <laughs> exactly. I don't. I, I don't. It's so called I, husband. <laughs> yeah, you're this husband yeah. of yours, uh, and. Uh, Maybe we'll have a, a cold drink or something one of yeah. these nights on Zoom. And the great thing about Zoom is you can be pants drunk and nobody can really tell. Because I mean, you know, that that's my new <laughs> that's my new epitaph on my gravestone. <laughs> Here lies John Kenny, pants drunk. Pants drunk. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Erin Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.